All right, recording has started. All right, we'll call the uh, June 16th, 2020 Mord Public Housing Agency Board meeting to order. I'm Greg Lemke, uh, the chair of the board. The meeting today is being held as a video conference due to COVID-19, the public may not attend in person. A recording of the meeting will be posted on the City of Moorhead webpage following the meeting. If the other board members um, and others on here would like to introduce themselves. Alexa Dixon, Secretary. Michael Carbone, uh, Vice Chair. This is Don Bacon, Executive Director, and I have Tony Bondal in my office with me, who's our Housing Manager. Well, the others, other guests, just introduce yourself, maybe. Amy Settergren, Human Resources Director for the City of Moorhead. Cynthia Ewing, Consultant. I think we do have Shelly Dahlquist from the Moorhead City Council on here also. So call to order and roll call is complete. Is there any agenda amendments? I have no amendments. Uh, no citizens to be heard. Nobody's called in. No one has called in. All right. So our first item then uh, for business is approval of the minutes from the May 26th meeting. I'll entertain a motion. I'll move to approve. Call second. I have a motion and a second. Is there any questions, corrections, edits to the minutes? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, against? Hearing none, uh, the motion is approved. Next item is request approval for payment of bills. And there are no unusual, nothing out of the ordinary in terms of payment of bills this month. I move to uh, approve the resolution to. Uh, Pay the bills. A second. I have a motion and a second. Any other questions for Don? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none, motion is approved. Next item under business is the executive director performance evaluation process. So I did do a brief memo on this, which I am screen sharing. So hopefully you can also see it there, um, but my performance review is due next month. Um, so I have invited Amy Settergren, the Human Resources Director with the City of Moorhead, who you've worked with in the past, on my performance review to join us for the meeting today. Um, and we can um, basically just go through what kind of a process um, does the board um, want to use in the upcoming review. So maybe I'll turn it over to Amy or Greg um, if you want to kick things off. Go ahead, Amy. Thanks for joining us. Sure. Thanks for having me. Um, Don had kind of stated that we were maybe going to make some changes to this year's um, eval system, which is always a good idea to kind of take a refresher and look at it. Um, I think what we have up here, this looks like a one that we did last year in regards to uh, the we had going out to staff and we had going out to the members, um, and then it was compiled. Um, there's there is another one that the city utilizes, but it's very similar. Um, I kind of just wanted to see how you felt about the questions um, about the different areas that were asked uh, for you to evaluate, and also a discussion in regards to uh, no longer including maybe that staff side. It's not it's not common to have uh, staff evaluations in an annual review. Generally, those are closer to like a 360 review that maybe is done every so often, but it's not common to do it every year. The most common would be uh, the board members being the ones to evaluate and submit for um, you know, discussion. So I just kind of want to open up and see what you guys were thinking, if things were working, things weren't working, and any changes you maybe wanted to make or had any questions for me on the processes. Anybody have any questions for Amy? I'm, I just, I'm just sort of trying to refresh myself on last year's process. Um, 
I think from a board perspective, I had r really no issues. Um, I, I, I felt it worked well. Um, I think it gave me an opportunity to express myself as a board member in terms of uh, my my observations of Don as a director and um, and gave me the opportunity to provide my my input um, on her performance going forward. So from a board perspective, I I really had no issues with it. Don, the because um, in the past, obviously, the staff has filled one out and I understand what Amy's saying. What do you think the reaction will be if we don't, if staff doesn't? I mean, will, there, will they be upset? Will they be asking questions as to why not? What I'm asking you to forecast what they might think, but. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, I think um, for me, it's, it's not a typical practice. It is one that I've initiated. Um, and we have done it several times um, from purely my perspective you know, because it's easier for me to tell you what I think than what I think someone else thinks. But purely, <laughs> purely from my perspective, I do think a, at least a break um, would be um, helpful. I, I feel like the feedback has been beneficial to me. It's been challenging for me. Um, but I feel like I've used it as constructively as I can. Um, I don't know if another year of feedback at this point would necessarily um, be beneficial and I know through talking with both the city manager and HR they've recommended that we at least take this year off um, in terms of the staff perception I would say that because a lot of the feedback was quite critical last year um, they may see it as being um, you know avoiding avoiding or um, not wanting to hear what they have to say and so I think what's most important would be whichever direction the board wants to go, and I support either direction, either continuing with the staff feedback or not. Um, but if we don't, I think um, I do need to be communicating with the staff about about um, about why um, and being upfront about that, rather than just you know not talking about it. Right. Well, That's a, yeah. Not just don't stop doing it, and even if it's a communication from the board, you know to let them right. give them some yeah, I, I, I agree. And I also feel that it, it is important to periodically get feedback from the staff, but I don't feel it should be kind of a, an ongoing, an excuse, kind of some vulgar language, an ongoing bitch session either. Um, and I feel that the director, whoever the director is, needs time to work on any issues that the that staff brings up and i i feel that some of the issues as i as i think back last year that were brought up by the staff were kind of one off one person one dig kind of kind of issue and i think that needs to be taken into account as well i, I would be in favor of not doing it this year, announcing it as a board decision, but at the same time, announcing a schedule going forward of when we would be gathering um, staff input in the performance evaluation. So in other words, saying, we'll be doing this every two years or every three years going forward. Um, and providing some rationale to go with that. Yeah, I like that option. I don't know if Amy has any suggestions on that time period, how often it would normally be done in that situation. Sure. Um, like I said, they're more similar when you when you uh, send out a performance email to staff or colleagues. Um, it's generally done in like a 360 review, and those are are usually only done when you want to have some growth, like like what Dawn did. She wanted to um, get that feedback to try to help her, um, you know, get situated in the new position, know what was the needs of the department, uh, areas that she can assist and improve in. And then there's other times that you do it maybe when there's 
some major issues going on um, that you need to really dig in deep. As for how often, I guess I've never really had an individual state that they want to have it done every two, three, four years. Um, I often don't see them occurring. I'm trying to think, and we had one situation in Becker County where I think they were under their professional organization, it needed to be done every, I want to say every five years. It was, he was part of the ICMA city and county of, um, management um, association. And it was a requirement to keep your certification there. And I believe it was every five years. So that'll probably be the closest I have in regards to how often. Otherwise it's generally done uh, once and then not for a longer period of time, close to maybe 10 years, that maybe you'll do one again, and that's usually because of some performance issues or something like that. So a Amy, are you um, aware of any policies regarding 360 reviews that are sort of standard policies that are included in, in a set of HR policies that we might be able to adopt that, that, that would trigger a 360 review? We don't have any policies. Uh, generally, it's just a, another tool that could be used. Um, you know, the type of 360 we were doing there uh, was not a full 360. It was just the staff uh, subordinates instead of like a full 360 would include subordinates, colleagues, internal and external sources. Um, they're much more very involved ones. This is kind of like a mini one. Um, and I know it's probably really tricky in, in regards to a situation like, like you're in, in the fact that you have a board that, that maybe doesn't see the day-to-day -day activity. So I can see certainly the benefits to it, but there's also can be some downsides of staff each time being involved in them um, that can give a different kind of perception to the staff in regards to who actually is the one doing the evaluation, which in all actuality ends up being you guys. You are the ones, the board members are the ones who do the evaluation. You may want some feedback um, and maybe that feedback can look a little differently than a straight uh, across the board meets expectation, doesn't meet we could also look at doing other ways of getting some feedback from them that maybe isn't viewed as much of a, um, you know, pass fail kind of situation, but, mm -hmm. but there's no straight up policy in regards to it. Yeah, perhaps, yeah, perhaps we should look at some sort of policy or, or process by which they can provide feedback because we, we definitely want their voices to be heard, but we don't we don't want to give them a, a pass fail power or uh, we don't want we don't want to give them the the power to to sort of upset the apple cart and and make Don's life miserable or make it impossible for her to, to do her job under the direction and and guidance of the board. Um, they, they they can't have our power. <laughs> But they definitely should have a voice of, of some kind. Um, and so we, I'm, I'm, I, I'm very much understanding the need to, to not include them in, in the process as we did last year, but I'm, I'm hesitant to completely silence them. And so um, I, I think we need to um, find some sort of process by which they can either trigger some sort of review with a very high threshold or have some other way of, of providing input. And I'm not quite sure what that is at this point, but we that's the direction I, I think we need to go. So Amy, I have a question since I'm um, my understanding is that the, the MPHA staff has access to you in your role. And so what if, what if they came to you with some issues or concerns? Um, where do you go with that? I mean, I suppose, it, again, it's, these are really open questions. Like, would there be a point where you would think, well, there, was, there sounds like there's some issues there, so I would contact the board and maybe talk about a review then? Or what would your process look like? 
Um, well, it would be similar to any of the other directors. Um, if an employee reaches out to me, depending upon what it is that they're reaching out to me about, I may reach out to the director, even if it is a concern about the director, it matters what exactly it's about. Um, mm -hmm. You know, because sometimes I, I understand sometimes people can just be a little upset about something, and I sometimes need that backstory of um, so and so contacted me what kind of happened and then we find out instead it was maybe some small thing change that set them off so it gives me some uh, you know insight of it if it was a more severe situation um you know i would probably take that to you guys and or the city manager um because of your guys's authority uh you know of the position to discuss what next steps might need to be taken if any I guess so. I I'm, I'm tend to agree in that we don't need to have them do a formal evaluation every year, and um, I like what Michael said though about for them to have some mechanism to have a voice. I don't know if that's possible this year or if we just take this year off, probably since it's it's coming up quickly. But then some kind of an email uh, again. It can be from the board. We'd work on a communication as to why we're making that change, and then also reiterate. That if there are issues or concerns that they can't discuss with Don or don't feel they can, that they have access to, to Amy also. So maybe something like that. Yeah, and I and then I think and, um, can... I would just interject. I want to help. Oh, sorry. No, go ahead, Don. I was just going to interject. You know, it's a balancing act because one of the things that we've worked on internally as an agency is, um, in terms of healthy conflict, is direct communication. Mm -hmm. So. You know, we certainly want staff to have a voice, but I think it's also important to message it in a way um, where people do bring things forward um, to me directly first and that we don't create a situation that becomes unwieldy where they're running to the HR director for everything. Um, and given some of the dynamics in the office, that is that is a possibility based on the previous patterns of behavior. And that is something Absolutely. that I've seen happen in other I, situations. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a very good line. We need to address that directly. And so I think this communication going out and then in the meantime, that gives us some time to, to draft a, a, a very thoughtful and careful policy um, that then we can release later that, that gives them a, a formal process. As, as far as looking at the two um, tools, the evaluation tools here, um, I guess first would ask if Don or Amy has a preference for one or the other. If um, I'm just looking at the the city of Moorhead one and the, the portion that says the decision making. Some of those there, I think, would be hard for board members. I, that looks more like it's a piece where. Staff or somebody who's working with you on a daily basis would have more information there. So I don't know about that specific piece. I was okay with the one we had last year. I don't have any issues with it. So just kind of curious if you want to change and what that reasoning would be. I'm fine with the one we've used in the past. I think maybe just one question for the board to take a look at is particularly without getting additional feedback from the staff in the way we have before. Um, is there more that you want there? Is it enough? Um, in terms of the areas, um, but I, I am comfortable with the format that's been used previously. I'm also comfortable with, you know, making some adjustments or changes too. Other board members have any preference or any areas on either one of these that you might have concerns with or. Probably I joined was late in the process last year, so I don't have a lot of feedback on this, unfortunately. Yeah, I was going to say it's probably just Michael and I who filled this out last year, I'm guessing, and the staff. I guess if nobody has a strong preference, or I'm fine with the one that we have used. Mm -hmm. I, I voiced my okay with that already. Works for me. OK, 
Okay, was there anything else on this from Amy or Don on the process? My only other question would be is, um, I know that Don, you had sent me kind of a list of the individuals who may or may not participate in it. Um, and I know last year we had the same question of an outgoing and incoming. So um, I wanna say that when we had the person, we did not include the person who had just recently left. I cannot remember names. Was that, was that true, Don? I think that is true. And again, the issue is over the, I'm, my review period is over the last year, but we have had some board members go on and off. Um, so I just sent Amy a full list of everyone who's served, you know, and who's currently on and off. But yeah, I'm, my memory if, and others could maybe remember too. I think we just went with current board members. Where was Terry on there? Did Terry, or did he go into the year last year? Cause he'd been a long-term board member. I don't remember if Terry was included or not. I mean, like Donna would be a long-term board member when she was only on for one month into this into the year, or was she there the whole year? This last year, um, I want to say it was like part of the year. If you're able to pull that email up that I sent you, it is on there. With Terry, I can't remember if he did any evaluation. Um, I know he wasn't in the meeting. Um, right. I, I, and we can certainly check on that and get back to you too. Yeah, I was trying to look through some old emails. I can't remember. What is Terry's last name? Braun, B R A U N. Because didn't we just have somebody? leave your group this time too yes time we just had azat resign from the board um and the other consideration might be length of board service like you know with terry he served for many many years um and maybe had recently stepped off whereas with azat he has only served since february so it's just a more limited amount of time Right, and he's only attended one or two meetings, I think, so. Maybe at least two, but yeah, more limited than Terry. It looks like last year we had, um, I just have the last names on here, McMaster, Lemke, Carbone, and Selquist. Looks like the ones who did it from the direct, uh, the board. Okay. I would assume we'd have Donna again this year. Donna, um, I have that email in front of me when she went off. I have it here. Okay, um, it, it'll Donna. say how long she was on the board during the review period, which may be what the board wants to make a decision. Yeah, it looks like her last board meeting was January 28th of this year. So half the year. I don't recall this individual that we did not include last year. I don't recall how it, when they had left, if they had just recently left or if they had left quite some time before, and I'm not completely sure. I don't recall when Terry left, but it's such a small group, I guess, is my concern. And and because um, it would just be Michael, myself, Alexa, and Shelly probably again at this point. I would be in favor of reaching out to Donna if she wants to do one. I mean, she's not involved anymore, so she may say, no, I'm good. But she was on, she worked with Donna for year, you know, since Don's been here. So she has some good insight, I think, and good, you know, to offer. And we have, you know, a newer board member. I think Donna's would be a good person to reach out to if she's willing to do it. Yeah, I agree. And would there be an option if she wanted to provide evaluation and comments, but if she didn't want to come to the actual evaluation? I would say certainly. I I, mm -hmm. I guess I wouldn't expect her to come. Right. Yeah, yeah. I agree. Yeah, sounds good. Anything else on that, the process for the eval? eval? Is there any kind of a timetable when we can expect that, Amy, to be sent out or? I think that you guys would um, normally do it in your July. Was it the next 
the meeting. Okay. Um, yeah, so you know, since the, the staff part isn't going to be on there, it, it would be a lot quicker of one. So um, I'm just kind of looking at the calendar here. Let's see. If you want it prior to that July, is it July 28th? Is that the next meeting? Correct. Yep. Um, yes, yeah, so what I could do is get it get it out here before obviously the 4th of July and then maybe have it come back in about around the 14th or something like that. Maybe uh, that week of the 13th, 14th, if that could come back in, then I'd be able to prepare it that following week before your next board meeting. That way it gives you a lot of time over that you know, 4th of July time so you don't have to do work too much. We want you to enjoy sure. the outdoors. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. I mean, that sounds good. So. And Greg, I wasn't sure if the board prefers to do a resolution to really make it clear what process you're adopting, um, or if you want that more informal. But I do have a resolution number if people do want to make a motion and second it. It's it's sort of a gray area for resolution is necessary or not. I'm fine. We have one there, so it, it exists. So I. Other board members, you have an opinion on that? Should we need one? Do you want one? Well, as long as we have one, we may as well adopt it. So I, I move to adopt the resolution adopting the previous um, previous evaluation form. A second. Okay. Right, we have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? <laughs> Doing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Hearing none, the motion carries. Thank you, Amy. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Thank you. So next is other business. We have repositioning options. Okay. I have my screen share, so I just pulled up this handout. Um, so Cynthia is on the call. Cynthia Yuen, our consultant that we're working with, looking at repositioning options specific to our 30 scattered site units. Um, and last month, we talked to you about budget implications. Um, this month, we want to talk with you a little bit about um, what are the full menu of options um, and what we're recommending we take off the table um, so that you have a good understanding of that. I know we've been talking a lot about the Section 18 demo dispo option, but just to be really, really clear with the board around these are the list of options and this is why um, we're recommending the demo dispo section 18 option. Um, and then we have another page where we can go deeper into um, kind of two branches within the um, section 18 option. I should say we're not asking for any board resolution or formal vote today. This is part kind of of a multi, you know, multiple conversations um, and presentations um, as we look um, at repositioning. Um, based on the discussion today, um, Cynthia and I can continue to work on more of an action plan if we do want to formally look at the Section 18 option and the board can hear additional information in July um, and make a decision either in July or August to really officially go go down that road. Um, so just to look at this first page, this has those different lists of options. Um, and we put kind of the ones we're ruling out um, on the menu first and then going down to the section 18 option and the rationale behind that. Um, so the first being the streamlined voluntary conversion, section 22 option. Um, this would be if we wanted to voluntarily remove our public housing units um, and all residents would get a tenant protection voucher to use in the private market going into that housing choice voucher program. The reason we don't believe this would be right for Moorhead Public Housing Agency is that it does require a total closeout of the public housing program. Um, and my recommendation is to really zero in on those 30 scattered site units first, um, because that's where we have some very particular issues and need for repositioning due to those units not being uniform and, and very costly to operate. 
um, but that we do value those units. And so we're trying to find a different way to continue to provide housing within those units. Um, looking across our entire portfolio, I see as a multi-year process with a lot more um, considerations. And I don't know, board members, would you like me to pause kind of after each option, or would you like me to just kind of go through these on the first page and, and then open it up for questions or discussion? Just keep going. Okay, keep going. Um, home ownership is the next option, and that's where we would sell the public housing units, those scattered site units, to eligible public housing residents. Um, we don't see this as right for Moorhead Public Housing. Um, and actually, I did a little more research just looking through old board minutes. And this is prior to when any of you were serving, including Greg, our longest serving board member. But back in 2008, the agency did do some research into this option and chose not to do it. Um, I didn't find a lot of documentation as to the reasons why, but I just thought that was noteworthy. And, mm just recently discovered that um, after putting this flyer together. So Cynthia is also hearing that for the first time. Um, but home ownership is an area where we don't see that we have um, good expertise within our agency. Um, we also have concerns about the current units that we have are in very desirable locations. Um, they're very easy to rent. And so we don't believe that we would be able to obtain comparable rental units um, to replace what we sold. And then finally, when we look at the current residents um, across the portfolio, um, they do not appear to be in a position to be pursuing home ownership at this time. Uh, many have recently transitioned out of shelter. And so even if we had the expertise and the background with all of the coaching and counseling that goes around looking at home ownership, um, I don't know that we have um, residents who would be making that that decision at this time. The third repositioning option on the menu would be the rental assistance demonstration or RAD. Um, and that's where public housing authorities convert their public housing units to long term project based section eight rental contracts. And I know we've talked about this in previous meetings where you do a very thorough review of your capital needs and you kind of come up with um, stable funding that addresses those capital needs over the course of a very long term period. And then you would go with either project based voucher or project based rental assistance. Um, this is not an option that we see as a viable one for the scattered site units. Um, it requires a lot of upfront resources, um, including external consultants and legal expertise well beyond the grant um, money that we have to work with Cynthia at this time. Um, there's a lot of deep financial and legal um, work done. And it also continues um, where you do still have a lot of regulation and administrative responsibilities. So this may be an option, you know, after years of analysis that we would want to look at for our apartment units. Um, but I don't see this as a good option for the scattered site units. Um, so that is not one that we're recommending. And then finally, the Section 18 Demo Dispo. Um, and again, we tried to put the description as simple as possible, because I know this is a lot of regulation speak, but public housing authorities can either demolish demo um, or sell Dispo, their public housing units, and provide residents with a voucher under the Section 8 program. So, you know, years ago, we actually did use the De the um, demo option at Moorhead Public Housing with those low rise units because they were too costly to renovate and so they were demolished and then we worked to do some replacement housing. Um, but what we're looking at with the scattered sites would be the dispo option, option where we sell, um, but we're really using the regulation um, in a very creative way to the benefit of the agency and the mission in that we would be selling it to ourselves. Um, so you'll see in the next column over, Moorhead Public Housing would create a separate legal entity to sell the units to. Um, we would retain full ownership and oversight of this entity. 
So it's really just a way to get more stable funding um, for the operation of those units and to have um, better funding to keep those units up. The subsidy would change from the public housing operating subsidy and the capital funding grants, those kinds of subsidies to a different subsidy under the voucher program, under the Section 8 program. Because Moorhead Public Housing doesn't administer a Section 8 program, um, Clay County HRA would need to consent and be a partner with us. So we would be giving up the subsidy administration role for the scattered site units. Clay County would take over those administrative responsibilities. Moorhead Public Housing would be a landlord. And I like to say a landlord with a mission. Um, so really focused on affordable housing. Residents could remain in their homes if they want to. Um, and again, our role changes to landlord only. And um, the result being the units would be less costly to operate and we would have increased, significantly increased revenue coming in. If you go to the next column or that column I left under the demo disposal section 18, that second paragraph says there are two voucher types a PHA can choose from. And that's where more detail is going to be in the next handout. Um, and um, I'll be handing it over to Cynthia when we're ready to go into that in more detail. Um, but first, let me pause because I don't want to get down too far down the section 18 road without um, seeing what questions you might have about the other repositioning options and why we're not recommending those options. I mean, you've laid it out nicely. I mean, to me, it's pretty clear. And I like them the, under the demo dispo, I think the most important thing I see there is that residents remain in their homes if they want to. Um, and then of course, it's less costly to operate and increase revenue. My only question on that one is what kind of, does it create confusion or um, wh where does someone go if they have issues or problems? Do they go to Moorhead as the landlord or do they think, no, I got to go to Clay HRA because they're the one who administer the vouchers? Is it pretty clear when they need to contact which of those entities or? Yeah, that's a great question. And I am a big believer in trying to keep things as simple and user friendly as possible. And actually that is the reason that we did voluntarily transfer our Section 8 program to Clay County HRA is because we were getting so many questions from the public and they didn't know which program they were working with. You know, all of those reasons that I know you're familiar with. Um, I would say that yes and no. Yes, in that it's very clear that if you're having property issues, like your, your sink is leaking, the faucet's leaking, you call Moorhead Public Housing. If you're having questions about your voucher, you would call Clay County HRA. Um, that said, the no part being you do have an extra entity now that you have to communicate with. So that is not ideal um, in that um, the resident does have another number that they have to have that they know and who to call. Um, and there may be some rerouting where they could call Tony about something that really is Clay County. And so Tony would have to connect them with Clay County HRA. Um, and so that is a consideration that, um, you know, that all that said, I will say we do have a very strong partnership with Clay County HRA. We have a joint on-call maintenance system. Our staff know each other really well. We've done a lot of very intentional collaboration. So that is definitely better than if we were working with just some HRA that we didn't know very well that we were asking to administer the voucher. So we do have that going for us, but it will be an added layer um, with that voucher administration. Okay, I mean, it is that that relationship is, is important. And then I don't know, this might be getting into the weeds, but if even if there's something, uh, a flow chart that just people can get that just shows this this for these issues you call clay hra for these you call mpha but right. yeah they're not like huge entities with a lot of red tape so it should yeah. be it'll be new mm -hmm. yeah any other questions for don on those yeah this is shelly dahlquist um you know we have alexa on the board here and she does help people purchase homes and um i was going to ask on the I know it says, no, you're not interested in the home ownership, the section 32. 
but one thing that would be positive is that um, there are the um, home improvement loans. So some of these homes that are scattered um, could be fixed if it's uh, a homeowner who gets these loans that they can fix the house and they don't have to pay them back until they sell the house. Um, you know, if that might not work for a lot of the houses, but is there a possibility to do, to look into maybe um, some of that? And then once the house is sold, then you could buy other public housing that wouldn't be <laughs> needing to be fixed. I know when we did the assessments for all the properties that need to, all the improvements that need to be done, I mean, it's just, you know, it just seems so overwhelming. And I'm just wondering if maybe some, some of that could be taken care of with that, or that's an option to think about, especially since we have Alexa on the board. Yeah, maybe Alexa knows the answer to that question. I don't know if there would be funding available um, prior to the resident purchasing the home, right? Um, I believe it yeah, would. I don't know. Our main what focus is the education piece of it. So I, I don't know the answer about the funding portion. My assumption, it's an educated guess, would be that that funding would be an asset if we chose to go down home ownership, um, but it would only come after the person decided and that education happened. Um, to me, it's not a reason to do it. It would just be something, a tool in the toolbox, if you're gonna do it, that's helpful to the people. Um, but again, we have these um, three and four bedroom homes scattered around the city of Moorhead in completely deconcentrated poverty in neighborhoods where you drive by and you don't even know it's a rental. Um, and I, I just, I don't know it, that it would be very easy to get that back. Um, in terms of replacing rental and then just knowing our agency internally um, and the limitations we have in terms of infrastructure, I don't see our agency really having the expertise to do that kind of counseling. Um, and then in addition to that, I don't know that our residents would really respond even if we, if we did. So those are all the reservations that I have um, around home ownership. Um, you know, Maple Court is another option that we're looking at, uh, which is interesting in that we will have that dual relationships with Clay County where on the rental side, we will have people with vouchers through Clay County HRA that have to call Moorhead Public Housing as their landlord and Clay County as their voucher administrator. And then we'll have another side where the city would be pro providing that expertise and there will be a home ownership option. Um, so we definitely will be connected to an initiative around home ownership um, if we pursue Maple Court. So that is something that's in the on deck for us around home ownership that I think is a fit in that we we have um, another expert that can work with people on that. Any other questions for Don on this piece, Don or Cynthia? Doesn't look like it if you want to go on to the next. So the next slide, or I'm sorry, the next page um, is going to be new for the board. Um, I have been talking a lot about the Section 18 option as it would be project based. That's what I've been telling you for the last, I don't know, year or longer that we've been discussing this. And again, one of the benefits of having the funding that we have to work with Cynthia. Um, who also understands Section 8 extraordinarily well, is that I've really realized that, no, we have two options within this Section 18 um, option. And so we wanted to take some time to spell out the two different options. Um, I will say there's a lot of complexity to this, so don't feel like you have to understand it um, completely yet. We have time to work through it, um, but we wanted to at least start going through it with you Again, not asking for any decision today. Um, I will, and 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 Cynthia will be walking us through this because she knows Section Eight so much better. Um, but I will say, after looking at this in the context of our agency and what we are looking to achieve through repositioning, as well as the units that we have and our residents, um, tenant-based is actually where I'm leaning right now. 
um, and before I was just assuming project phase. Um, so again, no decision needs to be made, but I just wanted to share that, that in terms of thinking about our interest in really reducing the administrative aspects, um, the, the tenant base has a lot more flexibility um, from the agency perspective and some real benefits for the residents as well in terms of their options um, to do things like um, move, move around and have portability. So Cynthia, I'm gonna actually turn it over to you and let you kind of walk, walk the board through this document. Sure. Um, so what's difficult about the Housing Choice Voucher Program or the Section 8 program is that it really shouldn't be that complicated. <laughs> we're really just, you know, giving, we're paying for assistance in the private rental market. And that really is the bottom line. However, there are really kind of two forms of assistance when you're talking about that. And the first form is the tenant base, which is a traditional Section 8 program. The housing authority is going to give the tenant a voucher. The tenant is going to look for a unit in the private market on their own. You know, they will submit a request in for that unit. It will get inspected. Once it passes, the tenant moves in. The landlord receives the funding from the housing authority and the tenant needs to comply to the voucher obligations to retain the voucher. That's a normal Section 8 tenant-based voucher program. However, we don't get enough of that in terms of funding from Congress and everything like that. So what has developed is also the project based section eight, the housing choice vouchers that are actually project based And this. The simplest way I can describe that is it's like section eight's version of public housing. The assistance is going to stay in the unit. So we'll say that there are a landlord has a duplex and they're going to project base that duplex. What that means is that families can move in and out, but if the family moves moves out of that unit, they will lose the assistance. So in that way it models public housing. So if a tenant moves out of the unit, there is no more assistance. Does that kind of make sense in terms of the big broad picture of everything? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Just want to make sure. So tenant based we call these tenant per, uh, for this is going to be a tenant protection voucher, but it's just a tenant based voucher. The key thing here for your demo dispo is that the client or your residents will be able to use that voucher in the same unit. Or they can go ahead and find a unit anywhere that they want in the US that has a section eight program. So your residents will get the benefit of staying in the unit. No one's getting kicked out, but if they want to move, they can go ahead and do that. So here then for the residents, they're gonna go ahead and they will pay 30 to 40% of their income on rent. So that also allows different rents to be charged as well. So let's say, you know, the portfolio that we're looking at for the scattered sites are three and four bedroom single family homes, cream of the crop units, everyone wants one of those. We can definitely charge a rent that's a little bit higher, not significantly, you know, over the payment standard, but there are units that definitely require more for upkeep and things like that. And people just generally pay more to rent a single family home than they do an apartment. And so also with that, we're gonna be able to look at more of the tenants affordability, especially if they have income in the household. So if they have income in the household, that means that we can actually go above the set allotments that is allowed and the tenant can actually pay up to 40% of their income um, on rent. And that also allows for greater choice for residents who are searching for a unit in the private market. So now for Moorhead, it's going to become a private market landlord. So let's say the tenant does not want to actually stay in the unit and they want to leave. Well, the PHA would be responsible for finding their own tenants to rent to. But again, this is great because it's a three and four bedroom single family home, which in your area is in short supply and people really want to. So we don't really anticipate difficulties with doing that. The PHA is able to determine how much rent they want to charge and what utilities they want to include or not include. And the good thing about this is that this can vary from tenancy to tenancy. So it's not contractually changed or 
contractually com uh, controlled, you can go ahead and change that from tenant A to when tenant A moves out. Let's say that you know you realize that water usage is really crazy when you are including water in there, and let's switch the utility so that tenants are going to pay for water, sewer, and trash, and give that a try. You can go ahead and do that. You can also ask for rent increases. So rent increases for the same tenant can be requested as long as it's given with the 60 day notice. And you can also change utilities with the 60 day notice as well. So it gives you a lot of freedom and flexibility there. Um, you are still responsible for passing an inspection. So the inspection is just slightly different because it's gonna be a section eight inspection and not a public housing inspection. Um, and then also if the unit is leased to a voucher holder, Moorhead will sign a contract with Clay HRA to get half payments. If it's not signed to a voucher holder, Moorhead will just collect rent like they would normally do with no inspection um, and nothing else administratively. So there's no rules to those units if they're not gonna be a voucher holder there. Does that make sense for all of that stuff? Yeah, for me, I mean, I'm good. Okay, so the key thing here for the tenant based uh, vouchers is that throughout the city, this is actually going to extend additional affordable housing opportunities to more families. So we're really talking about the families that are over income for voucher assistance and those who haven't been able to get a voucher because the waiting lists are so long. So you have a current resident right now in one of the units and let's say the you, the tenant decides to leave and that's great and that opens up that unit. And the next person that wants to rent that unit is someone who doesn't qualify for Section 8 or any sort of voucher assistance or public housing because they make too much income, but they make too much money to actually qualify for any sort of welfare assistance from the county. And so this is kind of what we're calling the working families. So they make just too much to qualify, but they're still struggling on a day-to-day -day basis to pay their bills. So this unit now is an opportunity for them to get housing in the community that's a little bit more affordable. Does that make sense? Yes. And what I would add too is it's housing stock that's available to both voucher holders and non-voucher holders. So it kind of opens up the pool of possibilities. Mm -hmm. So you're not actually adding one more physical unit, you're just creating one more opportunity for your community, which is really cool. Okay. Um, and then also same thing for the residents too, if they become over income and that means they're paying the full rent, there is a grace period allowed by the regulations but they have that grace period to decide if they wanna stay in the unit and pay full rent and give up the voucher so it goes to another family, which is also another opportunity in your community. Or some of them might wanna to try to move out and find another unit where that would trigger um, a rent payment from the PHA. And that happens too. Some of them won't be successful, some of them will be, but either way, um, there are additional opportunities with the voucher program. So when someone no longer needs that voucher, the voucher is going to go back into the pool to serve another family that's in need. So you have a voucher and you'll have a, an available unit that is also there. So any questions on the tenant base before I go over to project base? Okay. So project base, this is the one where it's very similar to public housing. The assistance is going to stay with the unit. So residents will be given a project based voucher, meaning that you have to use that voucher in the unit. Um, after one year, they can request to receive a tenant based voucher if one is available. And so this would have to be with coordination with clay. Um, and if they do receive one, they have to actually move out of the unit because they can't stay there and they have to use the voucher in a different unit. They wouldn't be able to use it in this unit since that unit is already tied as quote unquote public housing for section eight. 
with project base, the rent is limited. They will only pay 30% of their income on rent. Um, and then um, if they do become over income, they do have to vacate that unit. There might be a voucher available for them with Clay County. There might not be. We don't know at that time. That depends on how Clay is going to be issuing their vouchers. The other option is for them to stay in the project based unit, but that requires more head to do a lot of work administratively. And that means they need to go through all of the legal documents and remove that one unit from the overall contract. And then if that family leaves, they would have to request permission to put that unit back into circulation in the contract. So you're really working with the set number of units. And if an ineligible family decides to stay in the unit, you have to change your contract to make sure that it is in compliance with the regulation. So this adds additional burden to the PHA, um, who is again, a private market landlord. In the project-based model, move-ins are going to be coordinated through Clay HRA. They will find your applicants for you and run them into the unit. So they'll go through the application process and they're gonna determine who's going to be moving into the unit. The other limitations with PBV are that you um, you can determine the rent that you want charged as well as the utilities to include, but you can only get a rent increase on the anniversary date of the HAP contract. So when you're agreeing to project based, you're agreeing that all of those units will remain as project based for from a time period of 15 to 20 years. And during that time period, you would only be able to ask for a rent increase one time a year, basically. And so in the private market, we have a bunch of landlords that do rent increases every three months, six months. You know, they can have a higher fee from month to month. All of those things are available with a tenant based voucher, and that option is not available with a project based voucher. If you're also going to do any utility changes that will also require an amendment to the contract. So again, when you're talking about contract a contract for these units, you're talking about a 15 to 20 year contract and everything has to really stay the same. Um, the PJ will still be responsible for passing the HQS inspection and they'll have to sign the, the contract with clay to get the payments. Um, and in terms of housing opportunities, so, and for your community, the project based program then would just be the same thing as you were running beforehand. It's affordable housing for those who qualify for voucher assistance or for public housing. You're not targeting that working family. It's a lot of information that I just threw at everyone. <laughs> it is. Um, and then, like I said, it shouldn't be this complicated, um, but it is. And every day they love to come up with new things to make it more complicated. <laughs> but do you guys have any questions on a tenant based option versus a project based option? When I laid these out for Dawn, I was really kind of trying to look at the portfolio, the administrative time, what is going to be less burdensome, you know, and things like that. And so that's kind of where my mind was going when I was laying out these options. Is there a um, certain length of time someone has to have a tenant based voucher before they can leave, the, like leave the area? Um, they will need to have a tenant based voucher usually. So if it was someone who was newly admitted, it would be for one year. But since all of your residents have lived in the units for over one year, they can move out right away. But um, that would actually be for Clay County to determine that. So when they're doing the waitlist administration. Um, and so the other good thing about the tenant tenant based voucher is that you don't have to do a year long lease. 
So you could do month to month leases, three month leases, six month leases, nine month leases. Um, you can definitely do a year if you want to. Um, and I have had landlords that have done a year just for ease. And I've also had landlords that have done month to month for ease. So it really kind of works both ways. Um, Clay might have, you know, some preferences and things like that. Um, but, you know, with the good working relationship that they have, I'm sure they can kind of come up to an agreement, but there are more options available that way. Hey, Don, this is Shelly. Have we had any um, problems with any of our tenants with their utilities? That they're been, come, become behind? We have. Um, I know our Ross coordinator has been providing information about some, I think, CARES Act funding that has recently become available through West Central Community Action Agency and sharing that information. Um, but I would say, and I'm looking over at Tony, um, it's periodic that we do get a call that people are behind on utilities and then we have to follow up with them. Um, I wouldn't say it's a constant struggle. I mean, by and large, people are handling their utility costs. So with the voucher program, if a, um, if a client is not current with their utilities, it is actually a voucher obligation. So it is something that they could lose their assistance for. And so it's something that I always had asked landlords to let me know if landlords are or if the tenant is behind on utilities. Um, because if they're not paying them, they're not doing their part to keep their voucher. And we have a similar thing with our public housing program where people are responsible for their utilities. Um, depending on their income, they could qualify for some relief with utilities. Um, but for what they're responsible for, it is tied into their lease with us. So if they're behind on their utilities, um, obviously we're gonna do everything we can to provide resources to help them resolve that issue, but they are responsible to resolve it um, for their lease terms. So While you guys are thinking about other questions, I, I would just add, you know, in terms of the reason I'm leaning tenant-based um, is just talking through with Cynthia the different scenarios where um, project-based typically happens. Um, and our units don't really fit those scenarios. And it kind of gets to the project-based um, voucher program is more restrictive. It does come with more strings attached. And we are in a process where we're looking to kind of relinquish more of those commitments. And so it gets into cost benefit analysis and the benefits don't really apply to us. That what we typically see with the benefits of the project-based voucher would be maybe some units that are hard to rent. Um, so they're less desirable in the market. Um, and so with the, with the project-based voucher, you have kind of a feeder through the HRA, um, but our units will not be hard to rent in this market. Um, another scenario I heard was a program like through the Veterans Administration where you might have a set of units where you're really linking in um, services to those units. Um, by project basing them, you're really specifically targeting a very particular population of people with a very particular set of service needs. We don't have that with our scattered sites. Um, and the other scenario had to do with like if you're starting up a low income housing tax credit property and you have a gap with financing the development of that property by project basing some of those units, um, there's more of a guaranteed rent um, that financers would see as providing a safeguard in terms of um, them investing in that property. And again, we don't have that issue with the scattered site unit. So all of that said, it's like, if, if we want those added restrictions and those added strings attached, what would be um, the reason for taking on that additional liability and obligation? And I'm not seeing at this point, at least, um, any compelling reasons why we would want to do that. So my other thing just to add to Don, um, that I explained to Don from personal experience, 
um, we've all had to go through turnover and trying to keep records and things like that and trying to figure out where the portfolio is, what's included in the portfolio, what's not, what has been and things like that. And so with project base, legislation has passed in the last couple of years that allows the removal of the units from the HAP contract, right? And so in order, when you're doing demo dispo, you're already agreeing that you're gonna, because we're selling this to the PHA for nothing, um, you have a contractual agreement to keep this as affordable housing. So you're gonna have to find a way then to monitor the removal of the unit if a tenant wants to stay and then adding them that unit back in or do you really want to force all tenants to move out? So for me, administratively, I didn't want to force tenants to move out just to have a unit there. So I had to keep track of every single unit, the months that they were in the contract, the months that they weren't in the contract. And in terms of auditing a file, it is very, very time consuming. And I had, this was a portfolio of 515 project-based units, only project-based and just, the um, over 24 projects. And so just trying to keep track of what units are in and what units are out and how long and everyone's auditing and reporting cycles, depending on who is auditing you is different. And so trying to make sure you have the correct documentation for all of those units is definitely an administrative challenge and you have to have a lot of really good record keeping. Um, and we all know that turnover happens in this world. <laughs> So no matter where you go, you're either digging through a file, but it's not easy and it's going to take people time to figure out where the portfolio is as well. So that was another um, thing that I wanted Don to think about in terms of time spent on just trying to figure out what units you have that are actually project based. Michael, <laughs> you look like you want to talk. Yeah, Greg, you knew. Um, you you all know that I come from this from the homeless advocate perspective. And from that perspective, I have long advocated tenant-based vouchers because they provide more choice for the for the client. Um, in project base, you're you're limited to the project when it comes to selecting your housing and tenant-based vouchers give you a lot more choice in in where to live and the type of housing that you find yourself in. And I've, I've had people who are homeless actually not want to apply for a voucher because they knew they were gonna get stuck in a particular project and they just, I don't wanna live there. I don't wanna live there. Where if they knew they could get a tenant-based voucher, they would apply. And so just as a basic principle, without getting into all of the technical details that Cynthia is able to provide, um, I very much favor the tenant-based approach. I agree. And I think Clay County HRA has proven to do really well with this approach too. So I think it's a good option since we have that partnership with them. Uh -huh. And Don, were you saying that you you were tenant based and now you're leaning toward a project? Did I understand that correctly? No, the other way around. Other I around. Was, okay. Yeah, I kind of came into it assuming project base. Okay. Um, and because I think I was trying to, I was coming at it from a, a mindset of we're just trying to do what, keep doing what we're already doing. And um, as Cynthia put it, project-based is kind of like public housing section eight style. So I think I kind of just saw that as, well, that is most similar to what we're doing without really digging into what are the different options between them and why would we choose project-based? And so through that conversation, I'm definitely leaning tenant-based. And so, Okay, yes. I, I thought you said the yeah. opposite of that. So I was oh. looking and and the, the first thing under on the on the tenant base where it says on the bottom under city of Moore, it extends affordable housing opportunities to more families. I was thinking, well, why would we not want to do that? But <laughs> okay. Thanks for And I think point. through that extension, it really recognizes the phone calls we get from people where they really need help. 
um, but they can't even get on a Section 8 waiting list. Um, and so those are the people I'm thinking about and also people who could fall into homelessness um, where through this accessing affordable housing, having a mix of people who have a housing choice voucher or who maybe don't because they can't get it or they're just a little bit over income, quote unquote, but they don't qualify for you know, other assistance, they're kind of in that gap. So those are all, I think, big benefits of the tenant-based approach. Mm -hmm. And I mean, and I don't know your market very well or your housing stock, so I definitely had conversations with Don too to kind of understand all of that. Um, and there are pros and cons depending on what your housing stock is. So when Don told me that the scats are mostly single family homes and duplexes, three bedrooms and four bedrooms in an area where you don't have very many of them, that to me is an automatic signal towards tenant base because these are not hard to place units. Like everyone wants these units. If it was more of a single room occupancy dormitory style housing where you're not going to get a flood of applicants or again, like Don said, um, tied to supportive services where people really need that in terms of a housing first model project base is definitely a way to go because you're always going to have a steady stream of applicants. But um, based on everything that I learned about Moorhead, these units will not be hard to fill. <laughs> I agree. Okay. So it sounds like you have some direction then, Don, from the board. Yeah, and um, next month we'll be bringing like a proposed like action plan and the board can, you know, doesn't have to make a decision next month. They could wait till August if they wanted more time um, in terms of what it would take to implement the Section 18 option. Um, I, I will ask if, is there anything in a, any addi other additional information the board would like to see from us next month that would be helpful as we continue down this this discussion? Nothing for me. I mean, this is very thorough. It's very easy to. Uh, I just like the way that it's been put together. It's very easy to see that the differences are and advantages and disadvantages. I don't have anything else. Me either. No. Great. Excited to see an action plan. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Thank you, Cynthia. Uh -huh. Yeah, no problem. Feel free to ask if you guys have questions because it's it's a lot of information and I'm trying to just lay it out as simply as possible without getting too technical. Sure. Okay. You did. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I would just ask too, I mean, we're an hour and 15 minutes in if, if, if Alexa and Michael, are you still okay to try and finish up these last couple items or if they're not things we have to. Oh, I'm good. Know where to go. I'm okay. Okay. All right. So then Don next, we have the retirement plan amendments. I'll try to be very concise. I just wanted to give you a heads up. This is on deck um, and it got delayed due to the COVID-19 and We've really been um, encouraged to keep our board items to only essential items. Um, the city council did make a, a pass a resolution where we can start attending to non-essential items next month. Um, and so um, this is something that I plan to bring before the board um, and I outlined it in the, in the memo. So just so that you have a little background and heads up. Okay, thank you. All right, trying to get back to the agenda here. Oh, sorry. I think it's just just reports now, is it? No, yeah, it's yeah, executive some, director updates. Just some brief updates. Um, number one, it appears that our um, the play HRA transfer of the obsolete public housing units that will give us added funding will be approved. I am still waiting for the official word from HUD headquarters, um, which should have came by now, but we're we're still waiting. Um, but my HUD field office rep believes it will be approved. So that's very good news. That's great news, yeah. Um, the next item is just a reminder, there is a um, resilience task force training tomorrow. If any of you are able and interested, um, I did send the link out to you. If you need that link again, just let me know. It's on having an entrepreneurial mindset. 
um, in terms of a, a way to build resilience in the community. Um, the next update is just letting you know that unfortunately, Azat Haider, um, our newest board member, did have to step down from his position um, just due to some being overextended with commitments. And so I have reached out to the city clerk um, to see what other applications are in for board service to Moorhead Public Housing Agency. Um, and feel free to spread the word to anyone that you think would be good to serve on the board um, that we are needing to fill that, that vacancy. Um, we do have a new resident commissioner, which I'm really excited about. Rita Ruth was appointed um, following our last board meeting at the May City Council meeting. Um, unfortunately, she's just under the weather today, so she'll be joining us next month. Just a few building updates. Um, our scattered site, um, we have a number of things we're going to be doing, you know, based on our repositioning goals that is out for bid. Um, so we'll be doing a bid opening in July to put new shingles on roofs and do some concrete work for our scattered site locations. Um, our Sharpview elevator, um, I'm in the final stages of processing the loan documents. So um, we'll keep you apprised. We still, because it's an end loan, um, we'll be reimbursed um, around $58,000 for that project. So really looking forward to getting that all wrapped up. That elevator is working quite well. So we're excited about that. Um, the Riverview Heights elevator, we just had a final inspection with a few items on a punch list that the contractor needs to finish up, but we do have both cars operational um, and, you know, by and large, um, a complete elevator at Riverview Heights. So we're just kind of finalizing some last um, items there. And that was a very big project that's been, you know, years in the making and a half a million dollars. So we're really excited about that. And then finally, on building updates, um, we do have an air handler unit that's going to be replaced at the high rise. We're just waiting on parts and materials to be delivered, and we'll be working on that. Um, I mentioned the um, we um, can take up non-essential items in our next July meeting. Um, the recommendation is that we do continue to meet remotely for the time being, so we'll continue to follow that recommendation. Um, and then finally, on that topic of non-essential items, um, I'm hoping to bring forward some more information about our strategic plan at our next meeting. Um, that got delayed and kind of sidelined with COVID. Um, that said, we have been doing a lot of work within our strategic plan, as you can tell by the significant amount of time we spent even at today's board meeting on repositioning. So we have definitely um, had some gains with our strategic plan. There are a few areas that got delayed due to COVID. Um, but I'd like to bring a report and some updated benchmarks to you um, at the next meeting in July. Those are my updates. Any questions for Don on any of those updates? Those are good updates for the most part. So that's good, good to hear all those things happening. So. All right. No, no attorneys are on as far as I know. So with that, the meeting is adjourned. Very good. Take care. Bye, everyone. Bye, all. Thank you.